What's up guys? This is Jay here with Fantasy Labs and I wanted to make a few videos centered on our new lineup builder for NBA uh, which is probably my second favorite product at the entire company behind our Fantasy Labs snapback hats. Uh, Bales has already done some in-depth tutorials hopefully you guys checked out on the new features but they were focused on NFL which we all know is an inferior sport to NBA and tournament strategy is a little bit different out on the hardwood. So in this first video, I'm going to explain the updated lineup builder and what it means for NBA, as well as touch up on the end of, on why you need to be focusing on tournaments as a way to grow your bankroll. And then in the next few videos, I'll be walking you through my step-by-step -step process and how I specifically use our models and tools to build multiple lineups for tournaments. So let's start out by looking at the actual lineup builder and some of its features. I'm going to go back to yesterday in the calendar just because that slate is completed and we can look at things a little bit better there um, and if you just click on build lineups you'll see our generate multiple lineups tab um, you know, most people that enter these large tournaments probably spend a little amount of time on thinking of how to set their exposures uh, how to read into games and they probably use inefficient tools if any tools to optimize their lineups and this is a big reason why there is so much dead money uh, in tournaments, which really is great for us because of you know tournaments have a generally higher rake, um, especially in the larger prize pool GPPs. So the features we have um, allow you to set your teams exactly how you want, while also truly optimizing every single lineup you create. Um, so by looking at this, you know we have a few changes. Uh, the big one is the diversification meter, which I'll get into a little bit more later. Um, and then the ability to generate you know, tons of lineups, obviously we still have. Uh, for whatever tournament you're playing, whatever buy-in there is, most of them now are uh, a max of 150. Um, and then you, know, you can set min and max exposure from the model. You can also adjust that after creating however many lineups you want off to the side. Um, you can change the max exposure, the amount of players on the same team, and kind of all these features that we have here for you. Uh, and then, you know, the main thing is our new builder, the actual builder to generate lineups got revamped and is really significantly improved now. Uh, it focuses on more on probabilistic outcomes when optimizing. And I'll give you guys a quick example of the effectiveness uh, of this. Uh, going to this year's election, you know, Nate Silver and 538 caught a lot of flack for being wrong with their prediction that Hillary Clinton would become president over Donald Trump. But really the chances they gave Trump of winning were significantly higher than that of other polls and even reputable data scientists. And that's because 538 uses a probabilistic forecast and understands that voter projections are tenuous. And we can apply these same principles to DFS. And if you play tournaments, you'll notice that the best DFS tournament players are ones who embrace volatility. So the final odds that 538 gave Hillary of winning the election were 71.4%. And plenty of other forecasts had her at 90% or even higher. And we definitely don't need to argue how the polls misrepresented, the polls misrepresented a large portion of the country, but we should acknowledge how this relates to DFS tournament strategy. And continuing with this theme, uh, looking at this slate, we can kind of stretch it here and view Joel Embiid and, and Jaron Grant last night in DFS as Florida in the election. Um, you know, I thought for sure, personally, that Hillary would win Florida just with all the, the polls that I saw, just as I thought Embiid and Grant would easily pay off their prices. But using a probabilistic model, we have to consider the odds and the potential value of these outcomes, uh, account for polling errors, lackluster DFS performances. And if you knew Embiid was going to be the highest owned player in tournaments last night, uh, which he was definitely up there, doesn't it kind of make sense to go light on him or you'll fade him entirely in a certain amount of lineups? Uh, so, and the same thing with Grant. Grant's a guy uh, that we even have a, a low ceiling for. And while this model, the, both these guys show high, and this is a more cash-based model, and you have to account for the the high projected ownership. Uh, for Embiid, ignore the out next to his game. That's for tonight. He's sitting on the second leg of back-to-back. -back. So if you just do nothing else but um, kind of take this approach as being slightly contrarian, fading the chalk here, and you just cancel out Embiid and Grant, 
and that's it. Nothing else with, with all the tools we have. Um, you can go ahead and generate multiple lineups with this and make a hundred, let's say. Um, I like sorting by projected points quite a bit. I'll keep the diversification the same and you can generate these lineups. So if you sort by actual points, which is a really cool feature we have, so you can kind of test uh, your, your tournament strategy and go back. Um, you can see that the average actual points was 345.75. Um, if you scroll down, you'll notice you would have cashed in 68 of your 100 lineups if you played all of these in the slam. Um, the cut line, I think, was 332. And obviously that's, you know, in hindsight, taking a bead out, but it's the same mentality of kind of, um, you know, fading that high-owned player. So basically, what you can learn from this example is NBA player projections, as well as election forecasts, you know, certainly aren't immune to being wrong. And I think to be a sharp DFS player, you really have to be aware of this. And the thing with tournaments is this mentality still isn't really utilized consistently, which is why you see a lot of the same tourney players crushing it night after night. If you look at the FanDuel Slam from last night, you'll see Osimo uh, got first place. I think he got like sixth, too, and he was littered at near the top. Uh, first place was 100K, and he went heavy on Mark Gasol, who was 5% out. And I'll touch on him here in a second. Um, another new feature we have that's really cool is the My Groups feature. And for NFL, I think a lot of people are already aware of uh, correlations between certain QBs and wide receivers or tight ends or even all three. Uh, team stacks using a running back as well with the quarterback and the wide receiver. Um, the Steelers, good example, with Roethlisberger, Le'Veon, and Antonio Brown. Of course, these things are a bit more common, um, and I think people overlook this in the NBA, but there's still plenty of correlations that we can take advantage of, uh, games that we can stack. So going again back to last night, um, the player pool, we can look at a game, uh, if you sort by team and check out all the games. A game that kind of stood out to me was the Grizzlies-Pelicans game. And there were only nine available players on each team due to injury. Uh, ten, actually, on on the um, Pelicans, be or the Grizzlies, because they recently signed Tony Douglas. Uh, but anyways, 19 total players in this game. Um, if you sort by uh, team total, or, sorry, game total, over under, um, we can see that this was the second lowest uh, team total at 196.5. So you kind of know people are generally going to be off this game um, just because they're looking at that low total. But this is really slightly deceptive as people you know, don't really think about it with the fewer players available. Their usage rates will be higher, which can potentially cancel out the unfavorable total. Uh, it's more market share of points and how the limited amount of players get to that team total. So going back to correlations and what we can do with this, um, it's a new feature we've added. If you want a piece of this game, which you know you'll get at low ownership, you, you obviously uh, want to start with Anthony Davis, who clearly has the highest ceiling out of all these players. So if you just sort by um, just these two teams, you can sort by rating. Um, so Anthony Davis, you know, by far the most expensive player, by far the best player out of all these players. The, most, the highest ceiling. Difficult matchup, uh, of course, but if you click on his name, um, a cool feature we have is correlations. And you can see that his highest fantasy correlation is with Tim Frazier, uh, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. It's because they attack with the pick and roll and don't hemorrhage points to each other. And this is compared to, if you look at Drew Holiday, who has a negative correlation, um, it's because Drew isn't really looking to pass first like Frazier does. So with a type of game stack similar to what you would do with the QB and wide receiver and get those correlation points, uh, this game did end up going into double overtime. We can go ahead and lock in Anthony Davis and um, Tim Frazier. And of course Drew Holiday was out for this one which helped bump up Frazier's value. Um, and then if you do want to get a game stack and get more exposure to this low on game with limited players available, on the other side of the ball um, you know, you're looking at a team without Conley, Sebo, and Chandler Parsons. So if you click on Memphis, uh, we'll eliminate Pelicans here, and you sort by projected uh, usage rate, 
you can see that Marcus Gasol and Troy Daniels are the top two guys that you can expect to handle high usage in this game. So you can go ahead and lock these two guys in as well. Now you have a core uh, that you've made by using all of the information and data you have available uh, from the models, which all makes sense, which a lot of people don't really do. You have the correlations. Um, you have the expected highest usage rates. So what you can do is you can save this core to my groups, and this pops up in my groups. And let's say you want to make some lineups with this core. So you'll just build lineups with my groups. And you can do this with plenty of cores. I'll, I'll get into this with later videos of how to diversify between cores. But this is just a quick example. You can you know, lock this core in, and here's where the diversification meter uh, kind of comes into play. I, I definitely like that it's set at two um, standard. Um, and you can slide this up or down depending on what type of core you have and how many players are locked in. Uh, with a, when you lock in a core, you probably want to increase the diver diversification meter um, because you have your main four guys locked in every single lineup. When you don't use a tight core like this, you can probably keep the diversification meter a bit lower to get the most truly optimized lineups, which also helps lower your risk. Um, you do want some diversification though, which is why we have it in two, unless you want to potentially have the same lineups as everyone else. And setting to zero, if you do that, means you'll have um, true optimized lineups, so one through 100 of just the top 100 lineups, um, depending on if you sort by rating or projected points. Um, so first we have to go back to here and make sure that you have all the teams selected. Uh, you can go to my groups, build lineups with my groups, select this, and let's say you just want to generate um, uh, 20 lineups optimized with your core. Um, oh, and we can we can slide the diversification meter up. Like I said, let's do um, let's do four here. And if you sort by actual points, um, you know this is how you can see. Okay, this, so the core didn't lock in. All right, there we go. Okay, so you, you lock in your core, and now you see you have 100% exposure of all four of your core players. And then it goes down the list. You have uh, some randomness in there with the diversification meter at four. And you can see your average actual points with these 20 lineups is 347, um, which is really solid because the cash line was 332 again. Um, so that's an example of a way you, know, you can use these tools to... Uh, have an edge on the rest of the field in a methodical way of researching and, and basically doing things that make sense that other people aren't really looking at. And, you know, there was some luck involved with this game going double overtime, of course, um, but the idea remains the same that you want to craft lineups with the mentality of essentially going against the grain. And you can do that by using these new tools to optimize each lineup to give you the best chance uh, to win. So I'll finish this first video just briefly explaining why you should be playing tournaments, especially now, um, and why we've spent a lot of time uh, perfecting these tools for you guys, the multi-lineup builder. Um, it's because if you're a great cash game player at this rate in the industry, your ROI uh, is probably somewhere between 6 to 8%, and your win percentage is roughly 60%. And that's really, really good, but the amount of time it takes to grow a healthy bankroll from that um, to where you can potentially add a noticeable amount of income to whatever job you already have, if, if that's your goal, uh, that can take a long time by grinding like this if you start with a small bankroll. So tournaments give you that ability to reach that high ROI that you need to aggressively grow your bankroll. And that's why we put a lot of resources in keeping these tools up to date and it's also why I recommend um, supplementing cash games with GPPs because your percentage of cash in tournaments, of course, goes down um, coming from cash games. So depending on your bankroll, you likely want to start small, uh, small buy-ins, um, get used to our lineup builder, use this advice from this video in generating multiple lineups. Uh, you have all the tools necessary to start winning, and in the next video, uh, I'll go into much more detail of specific strategies that I use that you can implement um, using our tools. Uh, and this will touch on which tournaments you should be playing, 
how often you should be playing tournaments, how to identify and capitalize on randomness, how to set min and max exposures, which is an awesome feature that we have, and when the optimal time is to create and upload multiple lineups. Until then, uh, good luck playing around with our new tools, and hope you guys cash some tourneys.